So before we begin, um, while I have you all here, I want to ask you a favor. I guess this is a little bit unorthodox, but um, I want to ask you if we can pray for a, a man right now. Uh, his name is Steve. He's homeless. He sleeps on a bed of concrete, and uh, he's probably there right now. Uh, and it's cold, and he eats out of a trash can. And people want to help Steve, but he's resistant to take the help because he's scared. Um, he's been living on the street for some time, and so he's sort of used to that. He's been institutionalized to being homeless. And the reason why I'm asking you to pray with me this morning is because I believe that when the people of God are together, that prayer is a powerful thing in the hands of God. So will you pray with me? Lord, we, we lift up Steve together as one man this morning. We know that it's a horrifying thing to be out on the street. And so we pray, we pray that Steve would know that he is dearly loved by you. We pray that he would come to know that there are people who genuinely want to help him. We pray that you would make a way not only for us to help him to get off the street, to sleep in his own bed, but also that, that you would save his soul. We pray that he would be receptive to the gospel and that you would give him the forgiveness of sins in eternal life. We thank you for the power of prayer that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for doing that. So if you will... Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 33, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. If you're reading a pew Bible, it's going to be page 853, 853. Ezekiel chapter 33. And when you find that passage, if you would, please stand in honor of God's Word. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, If I bring a sword upon the land, and the people of the land take a man from among them, and make him their watchman, and if he sees the sword coming upon the land, and blows the trumpet, and warns the people, then if anyone who hears the sound of the trumpet does not take warning, and the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But if he had taken warning, he would have saved his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet so that the people are not warned and the sword comes and takes away any one of them, the person is taken away in his own iniquity. But his blood I will require at the watchman's hand." So you, son of man, I've made a watchman over the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered his soul, your soul. May the Lord bless his word this morning. May it not return to him void. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. So Ezekiel's text, the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel's long prophecy, is comprised of three distinct sections. Um, the first section is, is a little bit troubling. It's all about God's judgment on his own people. Right, the nation of Israel uh, was blessed exceedingly by God. I mean, God did everything for the Israelites, even though a lot of the time they weren't faithful. Right, so it was under the reign of Solomon that Israel became like the envy of the nations. Under Solomon's reign, Jerusalem was so blessed that silver had actually lost its worth. So imagine living in a place so blessed by God that precious metals weren't precious anymore. And yet the people, led by Solomon, Solomon was told by the Lord, do not multiply wives, Solomon engaged in polygamy. His heart was turned from God to pagan gods, 
And the people of Israel followed suit. And they worshipped Baal, and they worshipped Ashereth. And now the nation as a whole is being judged by God. After Solomon's raid, the one nation of Israel, which was a united nation, is now broken into two separate nations. Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom. And those two nations would often war against each other, brother against brother. Now what has happened at the writing of this text is that God is about to destroy both Israel and Judah. He's raised up Assyria, a pagan nation. You've heard of their capital, Nineveh. They were an exceedingly murderous people. And God has raised up Assyria as his rod of judgment to destroy Israel and Judah. The second portion of this text has to do with God's judgment over Assyria. Even though God raised Assyria up to destroy those nations, Assyria did so with a prideful heart and a haughty mouth. And so that second portion has to do with God punishing the Assyrians for their pride. This third section begins where we are today in chapter 33. This section is all about hope. Where the first two sections were about judgment and admittedly grim, this section is sort of breaking through a ray of hope into a desperate situation. It begins with this, this idea of the watchman. You see, in the ancient Near East, um, if you lived in a city, that city was fortified by walls. If you lived in a good city, it was stone walls. Usually it'd be two layers of stone, and in between those layers would be rubble and dirt. So if an army wanted to take siege of the city, it would either have to, either have to penetrate those walls or go over the walls and open the gate and let the army in. The best chance was to go over the walls because usually those walls were so strong um, you couldn't get through them. What cities did was they put a, a series of vestibules on top of the walls and they put watchmen in those vestibules so that 360 degrees around the city, the watchmen would be observing the land around to make sure that if there were invaders coming, they would sound the alarm and that way the people would have a better chance of defending themselves. So the watchman had an exceedingly important role. Uh, if you were in one of those cities, you could sleep at night because you knew there was a faithful watchman right, waiting on top of that wall, observing everything, and ready to sound the alarm if necessary. So let's look at this text. Verse 1, The word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel's a prophet, and so he receives special revelation from God. Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, If I bring a sword on a land, notice that it's the Lord that is bringing the sword. The Lord is judging the land. And the people of the land take a man from among them and make him their watchman. And if he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows the trumpet and warns the people, then if anyone who hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, and the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But if he had taken warning, he would have saved his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, so that the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes away any one of them, that person has been taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require of the watchman's hand. The watchman had a moral imperative, a responsibility that if he saw something, he needed to sound the trumpet, right? Because it would be a wicked thing if the watchman saw the threat and just decided to ignore it, right? Because he would be essentially condoning the taking of life. He would have a part in the murder that was going to go on there. And so Ezekiel is given this sort of watchman paradigm, and look what it says in verse 7. So you, son of man, I've made a watchman of the house of Israel— God has now taken this idea of the watchman and he's placed that commission upon Ezekiel. Ezekiel now is the watchman over the nation of Israel. He now has a moral responsibility to sound the alarm, to herald what the word that uh, the Lord gave him. It says, Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall go and give the morning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. So in other words, if Ezekiel didn't carry out his commission as a watchman, he would have in fact been sinning. 
right? So if you don't warn the people, Ezekiel, you're sinning. If you do warn the people, look what it says, the last verse there in verse 9, you will have delivered your soul, right? So there was an imperative on Ezekiel to take care of that. You probably see it by now that although we're not Ezekiel and although we're not Old Testament Israelites, there's a lot of principles and precepts that apply to us in this text, right? Because we too have been given a commission. Let's take a look at what that commission is. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. And we'll pick it up at verse 16. If you're reading a pew Bible, though, um, it'll be page 989. Matthew chapter 28. We'll be hopping around a lot, so keep your thumb in this one. We'll pick it up at verse 16 here. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus commissioned his church to make disciples of all nations, right? A lot of people will mention that great commission, but they won't recognize the foundation from which that command flows, right? Look at, look at verse 18. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Authority in heaven is where, that's where God dwells, right? So all authority in heaven and all authority on earth where man dwells is Jesus's. So in other words, there's no area, there's no realm of authority that is outside of the dominion of Jesus. Not the realm of politics, not the realm of religion, not the realm of philosophy, not education. All of that Christ has authority in, right? You see that. And it is on that basis that he says, go therefore and make disciples. Whenever you see therefore, you're supposed to say, what is it there for? The basis of that commission is that Jesus has all authority. And sometimes people don't recognize what Jesus is doing here. This is, this is important. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, but keep your, thumb in, uh, keep your thumb in Matthew 28. Genesis chapter 1. If you're reading a pew Bible, it'll be the first page. You should have known that one, right? And we'll look at, uh, we'll start at verse 26. Let's see what Jesus is doing in Matthew 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he had created them. Male and female, he had created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So, look. Adam was made different, right? Right? He, he wasn't made like the angels. He wasn't made like the livestock. There was something different about man when he was created. Man was given what theologians call the imago Dei, the image and likeness of God, right? That makes man distinct from the balance of creation. And then God put man over the earth as his vice regent. Man was only under God, and the rest of the earth was subjugated to man. And God gave Adam a commission, the commission was to go and subdue the earth, to take dominion over the earth, and to be fruitful and multiply. That verse, verse 28, is called the dominion mandate. Adam was given that charge to accomplish those things, to take dominion over the earth, to be fruitful and multiply. And if you read to chapter 3, you know that that didn't happen. Right, because Adam, instead of obeying the commission that God gave him, he decided to commit cosmic treason. Like, you hear a lot of people downplay what happened at the fall. You know, Adam and Eve eating the fruit from the forbidden tree. 
But what you've got to realize, Adam was trying to knock God off his throne there. Like that was cosmic treason. Don't lower it down like it's no big deal. What he did there was sin against the God who put the breath in his lungs so that he could be like him. Think about that. That's, that's huge. That's cosmic treason. And what Adam did was he brought all of humanity into sin, right? He didn't complete the dominion mandate. He didn't subdue the earth and take dominion over it. He failed. One of the motifs in the New Testament, one of the names in which, which Christ is often called, and it's really a, a thread that runs right through the New Testament, Jesus is often called the second Adam. Right? Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 5. He's the second Adam. Whereas the first Adam sinned and brought death into the world, the second Adam has died and thereby doing brought life into the world. Right? And this second Adam is succeeding every place where the first Adam failed. Right? So Adam was, was tempted, right? And he failed. He sinned. The second Adam was tempted... Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days. He was tempted by Satan himself, just like Adam was, and he succeeded. Whereas the second Adam brought death into the world, uh, rather the first Adam brought death into the world, the second Adam brought life. And he's completing, he's marking all the boxes, succeeding every place where the first Adam failed. So, think about this. Matthew chapter 28, turn back there. Adam was told to be fruitful and multiply and take dominion over the earth, right? Look at what Jesus is doing. I, he says, have dominion over the heavens and over the earth. I have all authority. Now go and make disciples of all nations. Nations is the Greek term ethnos, from which we get the term ethnicity, meaning all people, not merely just nation states. That's part of it, but all people. Make disciples of all nations. What Jesus is doing in that text, in the Great Commission, is he is being fruitful and multiplying. He's taking dominion where Adam failed. He's subduing the earth, not by what Adam was supposed to do, by by having children be born. Jesus is doing that. He's doing it a little differently. Instead of being born, you need to be born again. Adam is... Uh, was charged to, to fill the earth in that way. Jesus is basically resurrecting dead men and filling the dominion mandate where Adam failed. Now, if Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth, right? And he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. How much you want to bet that that's going to happen? Like when Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, and it's, on the basis of that, he's saying, I have all authority. How much you want to bet that he's going to accomplish what he's commanded his church to do? Because a lot of people don't realize that. A lot of people say, well, yeah, we're supposed to make, you know, we're supposed to make disciples of all nations, but that's not, that's not actually going to happen. I think whatever Jesus wants, he gets. Right? Think about it this way. Remember when Peter was, Peter was with Jesus and he was going to eventually denied Jesus three times, and later Jesus restored him. Before that happened, Jesus said to Peter, you know, Peter, I've prayed for you. Satan wanted to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you. You know that Jesus' prayers were answered, right? Because his prayers are directly in line with the Father. Whatever Jesus prays for, he gets. And in fact, Peter wasn't sifted like wheat. Although Peter sinned, he was redeemed. What I'm saying here is that when Jesus says, I have all authority in heaven and earth, now go therefore and make disciples of all nations, that's going to happen. That's not an if, that's a when. Right? So, a lot of people will reject this idea. Like I, t- I was talking to one guy about two weeks ago, and he said, well, I don't know if I can agree with the idea that Jesus is going to make disciples of all nations. And I said, well, why, why would that be? And he goes, well, it's because of my eschatology, his understanding of how the end times are going to play out. And I'm thinking in my mind, I didn't say this, but I was thinking, get a new end times view. You know, that, if it doesn't go here with what Jesus is saying, you might be a little bit off. You know what I mean? No matter what kind of view 
that you have at the end times. I mean, some people have this view where things are going to get really bad and Jesus is going to secretly come back. You'll be snatched out of your clothes and then it's going to hit the fan. I don't hold that view. I think we should leave left behind behind. But no matter what view you take, we should be able to agree that this is important. That when Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, what he sets out to accomplish will happen. Now I want to show you a couple of texts, um, both in the New Testament and the Old Testament, um, that sort of solidify that and, and sort of fill out what that looks like. Um, you won't have to turn to the New Testament text. I'll just mention them. So you remember when Jesus gave the parable of the mustard seed? He said, that the mustard seed is your small seed. And in Palestine, it was. When you plant that seed, it grows into this big mustard bush, really a tree. And Jesus says, the birds of the air go in that tree and they, and they nest. Jesus says, that's what the kingdom of God is like. It starts small, and it gets huge. Or he says it's like a little bit of leaven that you work into dough. And it starts in one place, but it sort of goes through the entire lump of dough. That's what the kingdom of God is like. Not ending in defeat, but ending in victory. Right? Because what Jesus accomplished isn't going to fail. Like Jesus is going to win in the end is what I'm saying. So let's look at a couple of texts in the Old Testament. Um, you know that Psalms, right? The Psalms are sort of the psalm book, the hymn book of Israel, and also really the early church used the Psalms as their, their hymn book. They wrote their own, but primarily they used the Psalms. So turn with me to Psalm chapter 2, uh, the second Psalm. I just want to run through some of these Psalms because... Not only did the Psalms tell us, you know, how the, how the Israelites understood, you know, God and understood redemption, but it also tells us how they understood what was going to happen in the end, like what was God's goal in redemption. Take a look at Psalm chapter 2 and verse 7. If you're reading a pew Bible, it'll be page 532. It says this, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. That's a coronation thing. Like when the Lord originally said that to a Jewish king, he wasn't born that day. Rather, he was coronated. He was made king. Ask of me, it says in verse 8, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. It's not just that Jesus is going to inherit the earth, although he is the meek one who will inherit the earth, but he's also inheriting, the psalmist says, the nations. Right? The nations are going to be his possession. Uh, take a look at Psalm 22. Psalm 22, if you're reading a pew Bible, it'll be page 544. We'll pick it up at verse 7. Psalm 22, verse 7. Or rather, I'm sorry, verse 27, my mistake. It says this, and this is a messianic psalm, by the way. If you, if you look a little earlier in the song, um, it talks about, uh, you know, uh, people casting lots for Jesus' clothes. This, this psalm is just messianic to its core. In fact, if you look at verse 18, it says, They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Most of this psalm was fulfilled except for the latter end. Look at verse 27. And all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. Think about that. There's a time coming when all of the earth will turn to the Lord. Sounds a lot like the fulfillment of Matthew twenty-eight nineteen. Go therefore and make disciples of all the earth. Look at what the rest of the verse says. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord. There's a time coming... When every family on this earth will turn and bend the knee to Christ. That's victory. That's comprehensive dominion that Jesus is accomplishing. Let's look at a few more. Psalm 45. If you're uh, reading a pew Bible, it'll be page 559. Psalm 45. And we'll pick it up at... Uh, Verse 17. 
Another Messianic psalm. It says, I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, the nations will praise you forever and ever. There's going to come a time where the nations forever and ever are going to praise God. Look a little further down the same page. Psalm 46, verse 10. You know this one. Be still and know that I am God. Everybody knows that one, right? Look what it says. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. That didn't happen when this psalm was written. But it will happen in the future. We're looking forward to that. Let's look at one more of these. Psalm 86. If you're looking at a pew Bible, it'll be page 585. We'll just look at one verse, verse 9. It says, All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you. Does that sound like defeat to you? There's coming a time when all the nations of the earth shall come before you and worship you. O Lord, they shall glorify your name. The nations are the inheritance of Christ. They shall glorify the name of Christ. It's a, there's a time coming when that will be accomplished. And the means by which it will be accomplished is the church. Right? Really, it's the gospel. Right? Because whereas ISIS and, and other groups down through history, you know, we can go to Hitler and Napoleon, right down the line, Genghis Khan, where those groups have tried to take over the earth, they've tried to inherit the earth, not by being meek, but by violence, right? From the top down. Christ is taking over the earth, taking comprehensive dominion over all things from the bottom up by means of the gospel. Not coercion, but rather by love. He's taking dominion over the earth by the cross. And Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Right, so this is going to happen, and we have the wonderful privilege to take part. Now let's talk about, like, like, what is the how and the what of this idea of having the Great Commission in our lives, making disciples of all nations, teaching all that Christ commanded? Like, how do we do that? What is it that we're to do? Let's talk about both of those things. Let's talk about the what. In the same way that Ezekiel was given this commission as a watchman, and he was given a distinctive message to bring, each and every Christian in this room, really man, woman, and child, has also been provided with a message that they're responsible to herald. And that message we call the gospel. Right? And so what specifically is the gospel? You hear that term all the time. Euangelion is the Greek term. It means good news. What is the good news? This is it in a nutshell. You ready? It's very simple. The life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, that if you should turn and repent of your sins and cast your trust upon Christ alone for your salvation, you will be saved and have eternal life. That's the gospel. I've heard two deficiencies in our gospel presentations. And I'm not pointing fingers, I'm just saying. The first deficiency is this. I've heard gospel presentations, and I'm guilty of this too, where we conveniently leave out the resurrection. Like the apostolic proclamation of the gospel. When Paul preached, when Peter preached, the resurrection was a key point in their gospel presentation. Paul tells us that Jesus was resurrected for our justification. That's part of our salvation. And when we preach the gospel and forget the resurrection, we're really forgetting the key component about eternal life. The reason why we have eternal life is because Jesus was the first fruits. He was the first one resurrected. And we can look to his resurrection and know that we too, in faith, will be resurrected. So keep that in mind. Don't forget the resurrection in the gospel presentation. That's important. The second thing is, I've seen people, not necessarily in our church, but people preach the gospel without also preaching the law. When you look through the New Testament, even parts of the Old Testament, what you see is, when people preach the gospel, they always include a presentation of the law in the beginning. Right? So law and gospel, law and grace. What does that mean to preach the law? Well, it's like this. In order for me to understand the good news, I have to understand the bad news. Right? So if I came up with you, came to you, and, and I had a syringe in my hand of, like, something, 
some colored fluid. And I said, Paul, you got to take this. Let me just shoot this in your arm. All right? You, you got a disease. You need this thing. It's going to save your life. Paul would probably run away. It would be terrifying with somebody with, like trying to, trying to put something in him, trying to change him in that way. But if I took Paul to his doctor that he's trusted, and his doctor went through a number of tests and showed that, in fact, yes, he is in need, desperately in need of that syringe, he would gladly take it. When you preach the gospel without preaching the law, oftentimes what you're doing is throwing seed on fallow ground where it can be trampled. But if you present the law just as the apostles did, just as Jesus did before the gospel, what you're doing is you're showing people their need for a savior. Right? So when you run through the law with somebody, you're showing them, the law, Paul says, is like a mirror. It's like a schoolmaster showing your need for Christ, showing your sin and the weight of God's holiness. When you do that, you're making a positive place for the gospel to be placed, right? So are there times when when you don't have to necessarily bring forth the law with the gospel? There are exceptions. Like uh, I was talking to this addicted person a number of months ago, and um, this guy had been struggling with alcoholism his entire life. He was intimately aware of his sin before God. I didn't have to beat him over the head with the law. He was already palpably aware of that. What he needed was the soothing balm of the gospel. He didn't need the law. But there are other times, in the same way, where the gospel really should be withheld. That sounds controversial, but hear me out. You remember when we had the marketplace outreach a number of weeks ago? Uh, Basically, we set up some tents We had the worship teams out there ministering to the public while Torrington had its Main Street Market. Um, Myself and a couple of the brothers, we went out into the marketplace and we started talking to some of the people, um, having witness encounters, uh, explaining the gospel to people. And at the end of that, I went up to this one woman and um, I just tried to run through the law with her and share Christ with her. And I said to her, uh, would you like to take the good person test? Uh, the good person test is uh, an evangelism method whereby you can introduce both the law and the gospel. She said, sure. And I said, okay, how many lies have you told? And I kid you not, she said to me, I've never told a lie. And I was like, all right. Maybe that's possible. I don't think it's possible, but all right. I said, how about this one? Have you ever disobeyed your mother and father, right? Because that's another one of the commandments. Don't bear fault witness. Obey mother and father. She told me, no, I've always obeyed my mother and father. I knew right then that woman was a liar, right? Because there are no children that have consistently obeyed mother and father just in the same way that there are no human beings that haven't lied, right? I knew right then that that woman was not a suitable candidate to receive the gospel. So I didn't cast my pearls before swine. If you're not sick, you have no need of a physician, Jesus said. And so I left her with Moses. Moses is deliverer deliver of the wall. And those people who are self-righteous are, most, are the people who are most being beaten up by the law. That's why they have that facade of righteousness. And so I let Moses, Moses deal with her. There's a scene in the Pilgrim's Progress where Christian, the main character, is being clubbed by Moses himself. That's a picture of the human conscience without Christ. Either you'll be clubbed and you'll try to put on a facade of righteousness or you'll just sort of give up and run headlong into sin in another direction. So law and gospel, including the resurrection in our gospel talk. When we talk about Jesus, we need to talk about Jesus' law just like he did. Right? If you look at Jesus' ministry and the ministry of the apostles, they always had law and gospel every time. You're not going to find a place in the New Testament that doesn't have that long gospel paradigm. Think about the woman at the well. Jesus went to her, go get your husband. I don't have a husband. Right, you've had five husbands, and the guy you're shacking up with now isn't your husband. That's the law. You shall not commit adultery. Right? But then what did he do? Gospel. I who speak to you am he. I'm the Messiah. 
I'm looking for people who will worship in spirit and truth. Long gospel. Think about the first sermon in Acts. Peter, what does he say? You Jews, by the hands of lawless men, crucified the author of life. That's the law. You shall not kill. And then what does he say? Repent and be baptized and receive the forgiveness of sins. Gospel. Law and gospel. You see it right through the New Testament. You even see it in places in the Old Testament. Let's talk about the how of doing that, right? Because a lot of people, I found, are nervous in talking to people about Christ. Like, like there's certain social pressures, especially where we live in our culture, right? Some people don't want to risk that social discomfort of ruining the time to talk about Jesus. Right? But Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll what? Confess you before my Father. I want Jesus to confess me and you before his Father. Like, I want that. So don't let social pressures talk you out of telling somebody the words of life. Because they're in desperate need of that gospel, right? Every single one of us is. And the gospel, by the way, is not merely something for new Christians to get them in the door. Like, yeah, you know, the gospel, that's for the beginner Christian. No, it's not. You need to be preaching yourself, uh, to yourself the gospel every single day. Why would that be? Because you sin every single day, and you need the gospel just as much as you did when you started believing. The gospel isn't a new thing. It's life. And it's an integral part of our life, and it, or at least it should be, in the same way that repentance is. Um, One of the beautiful things that the Protestant Reformation brought uh, sort of back to Christianity uh, was this idea that your vacation, no matter what it is, can be done unto God. Right? So in medieval Roman Catholicism, they taught that, you know, sort of the Roman Catholic clergy were like up here, and all other professions were sort of common and ignoble. The Reformers, like Calvin and Luther and Zwingli, They said, no, the Bible actually teaches that no matter what you do, you're to do it to the glory of God. So if you're digging ditches, or you're working at IBM, or you're working at a Fortune 500 company, whatever it is, you're doing that job with excellence to God's glory. So no matter what your profession is, you're doing it excellently in order that people might see your works and praise your Father in heaven. That's what Jesus said. And in so doing, what you will find in doing your job excellently is that people will want to talk to you. Like, if you're really good at what you're doing, that's going to open up a lot of opportunities for gospel gospel conversations, right? Does that mean that you should not be working and be talking about Jesus? I made that mistake once, I'll be honest with you. Don't do that, right? Because you're being paid to do a job. You're honoring God in your vocation, You're loving your neighbor as you faithfully work your job. But there comes times, and you've had those times, right, where there's going to be people who want to talk to you. When tragedy strikes, when somebody dies, when somebody loses their job, whatever the case, those are opportunities that you need to be waiting on to preach law and gospel together. And you may consider your job, and and I've often felt this way, as something like a tent maker ministry, right? Right? So you're working not only to provide a living for yourself and your family, but you're also working so that you'll have time on the side where you can tell other people about Jesus, where you can hail the news of the watchman, right? So, um, you know, your vocation isn't necessarily uh, antithetical to preaching long gospel. There are some people, and probably some people in this room, who've had special giftings and a special calling on their life, a special commission that goes above and beyond um, the kind of vocations that we normally have. There are going to be people in this room, and I believe more than one of them, who has a calling not only to serve God in a normal vocation, but actually as a full-time gospel preacher, whether it be in the pastorate or whether it be in in a mission. You've got to ask yourself the question, has God called me to lay down everything that I have now so that I can go abroad and preach the gospel? Ask yourself that. And if the answer is yes, 
don't pull a Jonah and run from God. Because he'll get you out there one way or another, right? That is a wonderful, dignified, and glorious thing. To put aside our Western comforts and to go wherever God has called us to make Christ famous in that area. And that might be Minnesota, it might be L.A., or it might be Uganda. You don't know. But ask yourself that question soberly and seriously. Has God called me to that? Or has God called me to full-time ministry where I am? That may be. Only you will know that. Uh, I don't believe a calling is sort of an esoteric thing, like people feel they're called. Rather, a calling from God is when your church, your local church, recognizes that calling. And if that's you, take it seriously. Maybe you've been given those gifts, those special gifts, where you can have full-time gospel ministry. Let's talk about the, the, purpose of, the purpose of all this, right? What is the purpose of evangelism and missions? Right, we're going to be talking about missions all month. We'll talk about it um, in Sunday school today. What is, what is really the end to that? Because mission is not an end in and of itself. Like evangelism isn't, isn't a terminus, right? There's something beyond that. It's a means to an end. So is missions. God's global purpose in missions is not just to get people saved, although that's a big part of it. The purpose of evangelism, the purpose of the Great Commission, the purpose of God taking com- comprehensive dominion over the earth, the purpose of all of redemption, really, is worship. God is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And people will think about that and be like, well, that makes me uncomfortable because why does God so desperately want us to worship? Why would he go through all the trouble of all of creation and redemption so that people might worship him? And you'll hear unbelievers talk like that, like, why is God a jealous God? You know, you, you know the commandment, you shall have no gods before me for I am a jealous God. Why is God jealous? Why is God so determined to get my worship? Let me tell you, God doesn't need your worship. Like, you're not adding anything to God when you worship him. When you evangelize and make your life a living sacrifice unto God, when you go out there and you put yourself out there and you preach the gospel even when it hurts, you're not helping God. God doesn't... There's not, nothing in God that's lacking so much that he needs you. The reason why you worship, and whether it's evangelism, which is a form of worship, or whether it's when we sing these wonderful hymns, the reason why you're doing those things is because you need your worship, his worship. You need to be worshiping God. Because look, God is the greatest conceivable being that exists. Think about the things you enjoy in life, right? You enjoy... Maybe eating, I do, right? Maybe you enjoy playing music. Maybe you enjoy playing games. Whatever it is that you enjoy, those are little reflections of how good God is. So like a lot of people think that God is a buzzkill. Like, you know, I like these things over here, but I don't like going to church. That's like saying, I like ice cream at Dairy Queen, but I don't want to go to an ice cream factory. If you enjoy things that God has made, then you would really enjoy God. And the reason why God commands people to worship him, the reason why God commands people to evangelize, the reason why God gives gifts to men so that they will go out and risk their life and land for missions is for worship because you worshiping him will bring you the greatest amount of joy. And whatever you're excited about and whatever you're passionate about, you will tell others about. Like, I got a book in the mail the other day. I was excited about it. I told my kids about it. They didn't want to hear about it. I did that because I was excited about the book. When you receive satisfaction and joy from Christ, what you're doing is you're developing fuel for worship. And when you worship, you automatically will tell others about it. Spurgeon said that if you don't tell others about Christ, then Christ has no, of you, no use to you. And I think that's true. If you're, if you're living a, a Christian life where Christ isn't valuable enough to you so that you won't go and tell people, especially your loved ones, about sin and grace, what you're doing is 
Essentially, you're saying, I don't love them enough to, to tell them the words that will save them. That's a heavy burden, but that's the burden we've been given, to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them all that I've commanded. Discipleship is a part of that, but it's all bound up in worship. And in worshiping God, we receive delight, we receive joy. And those other things that God has provided, the things that we enjoy on this earth, are also fuel for worship. Right, that bowl of ice cream you like to eat was given to you by God, not so you'll realize how good that ice cream is, but so that you'll realize how good God is. It's all fuel for worship. And a main stream of that is evangelism and uh, missions. We shouldn't feel guilty because we haven't been faithful with the gospel. Like maybe we've received the gospel, but we haven't exactly we haven't exactly preached it when we should have. Right? Because people are introverts. People don't want to ruin an otherwise relationship, you know, with someone maybe they're already in a tenuous relationship with. You shouldn't feel guilt about that. Right? Because guilt leads to shame, and shame really is a form of pride, right? Because what you're saying when you're shameful is that what Christ did isn't enough. I also need to feel shame. What you should do, though, is repent and move forward. Move forward with boldness in preaching the gospel. Talk to your neighbors. Talk to your relatives. Talk to the people on the street. If there's anything this church should be, it should be a gospel-preaching church. We see the cults going door to door, expending all kinds of resources to go and deliver a message that they're zealous for that is yet untrue. When they're going out, spending five hours a week to go door to door, and they're preaching a lie, what are we doing? Not to make you feel guilty, but just so you'll think about that, are you in fact being a good steward of the commission Christ is entrusted with you. I hope you'll think about that this morning. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we, we are so very grateful for your gospel. We're thankful for, uh, for the sending of your Son. Lord, help us to value the gospel in the way that we ought to. Help us to make our calling and our election sure. Lord, grant us good self-examination, but also grant us grace. We're in desperate need of your grace. Lord, we pray that you would equip us to worship you in spirit and truth, whether that be by means of our worship here or elsewhere. We pray that Jesus would be made famous in Torrington. And that through our faithful acts of worship, this place would become a city that loves Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.